Welcome to your ABC Boat Hire Narrowboat and the start of your relaxing holiday aboard one of our modern fleet of boats. The boat will be your home from home for the length of your holiday and this video will provide you with details of the basic interior layout with its modern facilities and appliances. It will also show you how to steer and operate the boat safely. Individual boat features may vary slightly and these will be explained to you personally. A fully comprehensive manual is stored on the boat, but this video should get you started. When entering the boat from the stern deck, you'll need to unlock the padlock, slide back the roof hatch and open the doors. Climb down the steps into the cabin backwards, like using a ladder. The rear lockers are used to store two life jackets for tunnel cruising and rivers and wet weather clothing. Extra life jackets can be provided if needed for children under 18 and non-swimmers. Here you'll also find storage for the padlock, a first aid kit, rechargeable torch, anti-vandal keys, key for filler caps and a key for accessing canal and river trust facilities. This key also unlocks many of the marina gates. In the base of the locker, or sometimes in the floor of an adjacent wardrobe, is a safe for your valuables. The opposite locker has the electric distribution board and an inverter that converts the boat's 12-volt battery output to provide power for the 240-volt appliances on board. If there's a power overload through using too many appliances at the same time, the inverter will cut out. It can be reset by turning it off and on again. The control for the diesel-powered central heating is also situated in this area. Depending on your boat, it's operated by switching on the rocker switch or by pulling out the pull switch. The heater takes a few minutes to start. Wait for the start sequence to finish before attempting to start it again. If it's repeatedly switched on and off during the startup sequence, an engineer may have to come out to reset it. Hot water is stored and produced automatically by either the central heating or the engine. You might need to run the engine for a short time in the morning to top up the hot water supply. Depending on the boat you've booked, the bed layout will vary, but will usually have a selection of a convertible bed that can be used as two singles or fastened together to form a double, a fixed double, a bed in the saloon area that is converted from the dinette table. This is made up by replacing the long table legs with the stowed short ones and using the cushions stored under the seat to make up a double bed. Wardrobes are situated throughout the cabins and doors can be used to provide extra privacy. There's plenty of underbed storage and additional bedding is stored in cabin lockers. Your boat will have one or more fully fitted bathrooms. The toilets are simple and reliable and look similar to the ones you have at home, but because they're not connected to a sewer, they operate in a different way. All waste is stored in a sealed tank and it's important what is and isn't flushed down the toilet. You could use the phrase, don't put anything down here that hasn't been eaten first. Only use light toilet paper. Items like luxury quilted paper, moist or wet wipes, nappy liners and so on will cause an immediate blockage in the system and will need an engineer to clear. This will mean extra charges to you. If you need to clean the toilet, only use clean water or the toilet cleaner provided. Each toilet has a separate waste tank. When a tank becomes nearly full, it will need to be emptied at specially equipped pump-out stations and will cost you around 15 to 20 pounds. The toilet is flushed by pressing the flush button, which also has a light to show the level in the tank. Green is okay, but when it turns red, you'll have roughly 12 more flushes before it needs emptying. Some of the larger boats have a gravity toilet that's flushed by a foot pedal at the base. Please make sure the pedal returns to avoid using too much water. Water will stop flowing when there's a certain amount in the base of the bowl. The bathroom also has a fitted shower which is operated like a normal shower with hot and cold taps. 
However, the shower tray needs to be emptied by a pump operated by a switch under the gunnel, and this should be kept running all the time the shower is in use. Some boats have an automatic pump that'll run as soon as there's water in the tray. The boat has a well-equipped galley with all you should need to feed the family. Plenty of cutlery, utensils and cookware are stored in cupboards and drawers. There's an inventory included in the boat manual. The sink has running water and a pump will operate when you use the taps. There's also a double-filtered drinking water tap. To operate the gas oven and hob, turn and push the relevant knob while pressing the ignition switch. The electric fridge runs off battery and needs two to four hours of engine running time to keep it topped up. Boat fridges aren't as efficient as domestic models and they aren't intended to store frozen foods. Perishable foods can be stored for up to a couple of days, but drinks and non-perishable items will be kept nicely chilled throughout your cruise. But the door isn't designed to hold, say, four pints of milk. It'll break. The galley also has a microwave and toaster, which are powered by 240 volts. Remember, the power for these items comes from your batteries through the inverter, so it's a good idea to run the boat engine when these are being used. For your safety, there's a fire extinguisher and fire blanket. There's also a smoke alarm and carbon monoxide alarm in the galley and dinette areas. If the carbon monoxide alarm sounds, contact the boatyard immediately. The boat has a side emergency exit hatch, which can also be used for extra ventilation on warm days when you're moored up. Don't leave it open while cruising or in locks. The television on the boat will probably need retuning every time you stop as you travel between transmission areas. They're fitted with omnidirectional aerials, so it doesn't matter which way you're facing, but bear in mind the signal strength can be intermittent, particularly in cuttings and rural areas. Similarly, your Wi-Fi speed will depend on the 4G data signal, which is different from the 2G signal used for calls, and can often be poor in remote areas. OK, that's just about it for the inside of the boat, so let's take a look outside. First, where you should and shouldn't stand when cruising. Only the front and rear decks are designated crew areas, so don't travel on the gunnels or roof. Stored on the roof are the boat pole, boat hook and boarding plank. If you need to use the pole, don't use it as a lever or push it with your body. Use your hands and arms to push off from an obstacle or the bank. And don't use the boat hook for this. It should only be used to retrieve things from the water. It's not often you'll need to use the boarding plank, but take care if you do. There's a life ring situated on the rear hatch. If you need to use it for someone in the water, throw it towards them, not at them, and turn the engine off first. Finally, your mooring ropes. When you cast off, make sure the front rope is stored tidily on the forward deck so it doesn't get tangled. Remove the rear rope from the bollard and store it out of the way on the roof, otherwise you could trip over it, or it could fall in the water and become tangled around the propeller. Right at the bow is the gas locker, which has two or more gas cylinders. These are connected to a regulator, which will automatically switch from one to the other as gas is used up. If you need to change to a third cylinder, shut off all the gas by closing the valves and connect the hose using the spanner provided. It's a left-handed thread, so it's clockwise to remove. There's also an emergency cutoff valve, which should be used if you suspect a leak or can smell gas. If this happens, don't switch anything electrical on or off. Get everyone off the boat and contact the boatyard using a phone from outside the boat. Mobile phones can create a spark. The water tank is located below the bow deck and is filled by removing the water filling cap. Use the special key. The tank should be topped up daily, but don't moor overnight at filling points. Also stored in the bow and in the stern are mooring pins, piling hooks and side fenders. 
mooring pins. These should be hammered into the grass at the side of the towpath so that the mooring lines don't obstruct the towpath. Piling hooks are a convenient way of attaching mooring lines to canal side piling where available. Side fenders should be hung from the roof rail to cushion the side of the boat when tying up. However, they mustn't be left in place when cruising or locking. The rear deck contains all the controls for driving and controlling the boat. The control panel shows information about the state of the engine and batteries with various gauges and warning lights. Temperature gauge. The normal running temperature is about 80 degrees centigrade. If the temperature rises above 90 degrees centigrade, or the overheat buzzer sounds, other than at startup, pull over and stop the engine. Refer to the manual for instructions. Voltmeter. This should be in the green sector while the engine is running. If it goes into the red, or if the charge warning light comes on, other than at tick over, again, pull over and refer to the manual. Oil pressure warning light. If this comes on at any time, follow the same procedure. Pull over and check the manual. Bilge pump. Press this to remove excess water from the engine compartment. Headlight switch. Always use the headlight when navigating tunnels. Horn. Use this to alert other boats and when approaching a tunnel or a blind bend. See the manual for an explanation of the other warning lights. The control lever is effectively a combined accelerator and gear selector. While the central button is not depressed and the lever is in the upright position, the gear is in neutral. To engage forward gear, push the lever forward and for reverse, push it backwards. The first part of the movement will engage the gear without increasing the engine speed. Pushing it further forward will gradually increase speed. By pressing the centre button, the lever can be pushed forward to rev the engine without engaging gear. Once depressed, the button will stay in until the lever is returned to the neutral position, at which point it will pop back out. To start the engine, push the centre button in and move the lever forward to about one-third throttle. If the engine is cold, turn the ignition key to the heat position and hold it for about 10 seconds. Turn the key clockwise to the run position. An alarm buzzer will sound and a number of warning lights will come on. This is quite normal. Turn the key to the start position and hold until the engine fires, then release the key back to the run position. Don't run the starter for more than 20 seconds. Return the throttle lever to the upright position and the center button will pop out. Push the lever forward to select forward gear. You'll feel a slight click through the lever when it reaches its tick over setting. Pushing it further increases your speed. Remember, you don't want to be cruising at more than three or four miles per hour. Stop the engine by putting the throttle upright and turn the key to the off position. If your boat has an Isuzu panel, push the stop button to kill the engine, then return the key to the O position. With an Isuzu panel, the key switch must be left in the I position while running, otherwise it may damage the electrical circuits. Once underway, you'll need to steer the boat using the tiller. For some people, this is sometimes not as intuitive as, say, using a steering wheel in a car, because you do the opposite to what you might think. To turn the boat to the right, you need to move the tiller to the left. And to turn to the left, you move the tiller to the right. With a little practice, you'll soon get the hang of it. But the most important thing is where to stand when steering. Don't ever stand within the area of the tiller swing. If the rudder were to hit something in the water, it could swing the tiller round with some force. So you want to be well out of the way if that happens. Finally, there are some daily routine checks for you to go through. At the end of each day's cruising, you'll need to prime the stern greaser, which will be at the rear of the stern deck or in a cupboard near the stern. Screw it down until you feel some pressure, then give it an extra half turn. Before you start the next day's cruising, check the heating and engine header tanks. 
they're usually under the rear seat or on the rear bulkhead. The coolant should be at about the halfway mark. If necessary, top up with tap water. Only do this without the engine running. If you've had the engine running, let it cool down and use a heavy cloth when opening the cap. Check the weed hatch to make sure the propeller is free of any debris. Make sure the engine is stopped and keep the ignition key in your pocket. Get down into the weed hatch compartment, unscrew the retaining bar and lift out the cover. Check the propeller by hand, but watch out for anything sharp that may have been picked up. Replace the cover, make sure it's seated correctly and tighten up. To make sure the hatch is properly sealed, start the engine and run it briefly in reverse gear. If the hatch is not secure, water will seep out of the top. Well, that's just about it. If you have any questions, these will be answered at the physical handover. Have a good look through the boat manual and take particular note of warning and caution notes throughout and any emergency contact details. Then, Cast off, steer down the canal, and have a relaxing and enjoyable cruise.